here to discuss the, the potential, the limits, the possibilities, and how technology can be human first. So to have this conversation, I'm honored to be joined by Assad Rahman, who is di Director of Media and Digital Hubs MENA, Turkey and Russia at Unilever. You must have a hard work these days. <laughs> Melhem Najem, Head of Marketing and Digital at Stellantis and Zia Chade, Head of Business Marketing at Google. Guys, are you ready to start? So the best <laughs> conversation point, I think, is first to define what algor algorithms are today. I'm sorry, I'm very confused with the echo. Uh, so what is exactly an algorithm and how it's used in marketing? What are the stages of development of this technology today in the scope of marketing and communications? So maybe we can start with the ad because... Do we need a mic? That's do we need a mic? Do we? We do. Yeah? yeah, for the recording. Okay. Good morning, everyone. It's going to be... It's one or the other. Okay, when, when, when we started discussing algorithm, uh, it took me back to 2005, I remember, when I was still working for Unilever back then. PNG came with a concept called uh, winning the first moment of truth, and uh, which this means is actually the first few seconds of interaction between a brand and a person or a consumer. So fast forward till 2022, now there are thousands or millions of moments of truth created every day between consumers and brands, like literally offline, online, etc. And the best way to connect this is via algorithm or to understand how consumers behave. So first, let's define what's an algorithm. Uh, like the scientific definition is a finite sequence of well-defined instructions. So that's an algorithm. Usually it covers four areas, geographical, interest, demographic, and behavior. With behavior, there's another word that comes with it, which is data. And this is the new currency. This is what everyone in the previous session was talking about, data, data, data. And there's one of my favorite quotes, actually, for the former CEO of Netspace is, um, when there is data, let's look at data. When there are opinions, let's go with mine. So with this in mind, what can we do to understand the consumer behavior? In the late study that we did with Google about the consumer behavior, it's not anymore the funnel. We don't see anymore the awareness, the loyalty, etc. It's more a funnel. And people are more and more going between consider consideration, exploration, consideration, exploration. They're stuck in this infinite back and forth in the consumer behavior. And therefore, an algorithm will allow us to understand this. An algorithm will allow us to understand the behavior and therefore push a little bit the consumer to be able to convert to a purchase or whatever we have as a KPI. Uh, now, BCG worked on a lot of structuring for, for companies or for digital maturity or digital marketing maturity specifically, defining four different stages of companies. And with each stage, depending on how you unlock data, using algorithm will allow you to get more benefits from a marketing plan. Uh, I won't talk a lot about the examples of, uh, of algorithm. The most known for Google are uh, Search, DV360, for more specialized ones, etc. But I'll leave it to my colleagues to cover a bit more what type or the, what examples or solutions exist in the market. Thanks, Ziad. So yeah, basically, to start where Ziad ended, when we originally started talking about data, Obviously, just like any other brand, if you look historically, every big client used to have their internal PI team looking at data from different ways. But then, due to what happened in Web 2, where everyone wanted to move into Web 3, yes, we want to collect all the data, all the brands realized they don't have enough data. And let's be straightforward. Most of the clients, we relied on the likes of Google and other platforms 
to have enough information about our customers. We don't have customer intelligence. And then in, within a span of five years, you're having different types of data coming from different tech companies, some data coming from our end, and who's going to consolidate. And then every marketing department, every client, didn't have the tools other than going again to what type of AI should I have. First step to consolidate all data together to stitch it. Then trying to make sense out of it. And that's, I'm assuming, majority of the clients where, are, where they are in the current stage. From our end, I'll tell you, we don't use one AI uh, for marketing, for different tools, for CRM. We spent all of 2021 with the formation of our group to evaluate the best AI from different groups, only for CRM and predictive modeling. Then you move into the whole supply chain. What type of AI are we going to use? For which part of either supply chain or value chain? And then we can move into product. When we do product planning, just like any other client, you usually take 10, five, four years in product planning. What type of AI are we going to use in order to make sure whatever we promise the customers, they will see at the end with the product. So I'll give you a couple of examples of pure marketing for the sake of the audience today. One simple thing that we used very effectively when it comes to segmentation, we know historically, look at your banks. You would call a bank, they will tell you this conversation is recorded, etc. Look at when we have 14 brands, 84 countries within our scope, and more than a thousand dealers, how, ca how are you making sure through AI that every conversation done between a customer and the dealer is basically generating the best CX possible? And that's why AI was introduced last year, looking at sentiment, duration, keyword, and people will not even feel it. But we know for a fact, through AI, we know the customer journey is better at this stage. I can give multiple examples at a later stage, but... Uh, I'm sorry. Because this all leads for me to one question, which is the theme of the session. If we're looking at personalization, the algorithm is supposed to help. But what are the limits? First of all, what's the maturity of the technology to allow better person personalizations? And second, what are the limits to this person personalization based on tech? Asad, do you see consumer being receptive? Do you see this improving? And in which ways? And how far can it go, in your opinion? Hi, look. I'll put a little bit of perspective uh, on the end game for personalization through AI. Now, this is means to an end. The end game is not personalization. The end game is human attention. I mean, you look at um, the algorithms that have been created by Google or TikTok or Facebook. All they're trying to do is maximize the share of human attention, and then they try and monetize that with brands like ours and exchange it for advertising money. Now, if you put... Uh, why, uh, why personalization is important in that context. Personalization becomes a key channel by which you hold human attention, by which you're able to get your consumers to spend more time with you, et cetera. But that has to be based on certain relevance. That has to be rooted in certain consumer behavior. That has to be based in data and insights, uh, you know, uh, what, what we just talked about. So unless you are keeping an eye on the end game, which is essentially just around making sure that you have created sufficient relevance for consumers to spend time with you. Personalization is just for the personalization's sake. It's not going to give you anything as such. Um, the technology plays a role in optimizing uh, that relevance. So AI, algorithms, et cetera, they're there because they help you make sure whether you're showing a piece of content is relevant for consumers or not, or how, how can you actually make it more relevant. I've seen examples of work in the name of personalization, not just you know, uh, you know, outside in the world, but even in our corridors where uh, some of the people would mistake uh, relevance and just try and tick the box and say, look, you know, I've changed assets for different target audiences on Facebook and hence I've achieved personalization. That's not personalization. Personalization is making sure you have a deep-rooted consumer behavioral insight by way of which you're able to dramatically impact your creative or uh, content approach by which uh, you affect a decision in the minds and the hearts of the consumers. Everything else is just noise, in my opinion. 
So making sure you have the right data trails, consumer behavior data trails, making sure that you have the right technology suites and tech stacks available uh, to analyze those data trails and to make sure those data trails lead to some sort of relevance in the kind of decisions you're trying to make. And the decisions at the end of the day are economic decisions. You're trying to sell more, you're trying to gain market share, uh, you're trying to increase penetration. Uh, all of these things have to lead to that, the, those basic objectives. And unless we're looking at the whole thing from a very business first point of view, everything else becomes a very secondary dis discussion. It all leads to an end. We need to keep the end in mind and then look at, uh, to answer your question, personalization absolutely achievable. We have not, uh, you know, we're, we're living some of the best days of how uh, platforms like TikTok and Instagram and Google have optimized their algorithms to deliver some of those fantastic ways to deliver content to optimize human attention. Uh, whether we as brands are able to play at that level, absolutely not. We will never, any of the brands in the world will not be at that level of, uh, you know, creation of algorithm because they don't have access to that amount of data that these platforms have. But what we can, no, no not, maybe not, maybe not, maybe yes, but you do need certain amount of data for you to be able to make sense of what's going on in those platforms and then be able to create relevance for your uh, brands and businesses. So that, I, I think it's possible, I think you should do it, but keep in mind that personalization is only means to an end, it's not, it's not an end goal at all. I think we are going to go to Thank you. Yeah, I, I usually like to give comparisons, so one is, definitely on the consumer span of attention. It's the latest study is showing that human beings have a shorter memory than a goldfish, Nemo, if we all know Nemo. So we definitely want something that is less than four to six seconds in terms of attention. So that's one on the span of attention that Asad is talking about. Then at the same time, another study is showing that 78% of consumers are willing to buy from an e-commerce site if the experience is personalized. Yet 80% are reluctant to share data, but want a personalized experience. So if you put those three together and try to add algorithm to understand how this works, you will be able to answer the question or what, or what Assad is highlighting. The only answer to your question as well is do, you, do, do Unilever, for example, does Unilever or anyone else need this? Probably the answer is first party data. Going back again to my old days when I used to go to Mall of Emirates and follow the customer in, uh, from, one, from, uh, from one aisle to another to see if they're buying uh, with Lipton another product and see if we can do a cross-marketing campaign. So this is where the data that we can use and leverage in addition to the data that sits with all those players, whether it's Facebook or Google or, or any of the players. So that just, that's the only thing I wanted to add. Attention, this is the, the end game, as you were saying. Uh, I always understood that creating an authentic, uh, authentic, genuine connection with your consumer is the end game. Um, and this connection allows for uh, the attention that you're talking about. How, how, how to, to use algorithm to create this genuine connection? Because for me, theoretically, on paper, there's a disconnect between having something that is heavily automated to create this human, this personal, and it eventually this is what we are aiming for, this one-on-one -on -one rapport with consumers. So how do you juggle this, the tech on the one side and the human on the other side? Who would like to, to answer this? And so first, let's define, because when you talk about personalization, many will be talking about segmentation, which is basically not personalization. Obviously, when we talk about audiences, different stages, whether they're anonymous, prospects, suspects, or even clients, we only talk segmentation for ads, for communication through different platforms. It cannot be 100% personalized, although many people think it's personalized. The only stage where we can start real personalization and dynamic personalization is once you become a client. And obviously, you will get the personalized experience as long as you're giving consent to share your data. Because it's funny, everyone wants a personalized experience, but only if you want to share their data. So imagine now, this is the second time we meet. I know a few, a little bit about you, but you expect me to know a lot. So. 
I think the technology is there to create really dynamic personalization because at the end of the day, most people, it's psychology. You decide what you want and you might change your mind the last stage. Imagine how a brand can react to it. AI can, based on multiple functions. And I believe if we learn from what happened in Web 2.0 with the data protection and we make sure as brands act better with data, more people will give you consent, more personalization will be possible. And the end game, if we have a million customers, we should have a million websites reacting to each one of them. We don't have a million customers. We don't have a million segments. Every customer is a segment. The tech is there. I'm sure most of the clients are working towards it. It's in the middle how much people are willing to give you in order to personalize their experience. So how do you, how do you convince them to give you more? How do you get the consumer to give them the, the, the win to accept sharing their data? Well, actually, we ran a big campaign around it called In Charge because everybody, people are worried because they're no longer in charge. And the thing is, I can rely on AI for things that I know are automated. Uh, but, but in parallel, what do you want to say? So in parallel, I know if there's a process automated, yes, I can rely on AI. I know for a fact things that I don't know as a consumer, I will rely on the brand in order to help me do it. For example, when I buy a car historically, you know, it's a purchase that can be for four years. Imagine if I don't share the data of connected services, I might have an accident without even knowing. Only when I share the data with the OEM and AI, they can prevent a crash that could happen. When I know the benefit of sharing my zero-party zero data, then I will be willing to do it. Otherwise, why would anyone share the data? So do you, do you see the same reluctance from consumers? And do you, do you agree with this, uh, this way to get them to do so? And look, I think uh, when consumers see a benefit and, and they see an advantage, they're very willing to give you their data. So they, they need to feel secure about how their data is going to be used. And this is rooted in, you know, we've seen what you may call uh, exploitation of personal data uh, that has happened over the past five to six years. You know, uh, with due respect to the platforms, you know, if Facebook allows to publish your interaction with certain piece of content and address to the rest of your community, that's use of your data without your consent. More and more, consumers are becoming aware that as long as they have given their consent for a certain use of their data, they're okay with that data being used. And that consent has become uh, the, the very front and center of all the regulation, uh, regulatory work uh, that you see around the world, so GDPR, the Saudi privacy law, the UAE privacy law that's come into legislation now. Uh, very much rooted on putting, making sure that the consumer interests are secure and none of us, including Unilever, Google, Facebook, et cetera, are uh, exploiting that uh, consumer data that exists in, uh, you know, in our hands. And that's a responsible job. So when we talk about gathering data from consumer experience touch points, when we talk about gathering data on consumer habits, it's valuable for me. It gives me an economic advantage, but I make sure that I'm not doing it at the cost of hurting a consumer's interest or identity or you know, social standing, et cetera. Uh, so th there is value in data, absolutely, uh, to the point that, that have already been made. We cannot, regardless of with the, the strength of the platforms like TikTok, Instagram, you, having access to massive amount of data, a client's need to have first party data is absolutely crucial. Because for example, if I want to know, I have to reach, for example, uh, people who don't use deodorants for my deodorants brands in Egypt or in Tunisia or in Algeria, I need to know who are those consumers. And, but I must not advertise it to the world uh, at the cost of somebody's privacy saying, you know, for example, this person actually doesn't use deodorants. I must sell, I'm selling deodorants to those consumers. That's actually hurting, um, you know, how that person sees his or her own issues of privacy. So it's a, it's a complex subject. Uh, because it's becoming increasingly sensitive, and which is where the whole conversation you saw in the previous section about the Brave browser, for example, becoming popular. The Brave, in my opinion, the Brave browser 
is not becoming popular because it rewards you for what you post as a creator, but Brave Browser is one of the safest browsers in how it you know, safeguards your privacy and data tracking from the rest of the internet. When you use your, uh, the Brave Browser, it tells you how many tra trackers it's blocked in a particular session and how much time you've saved by not allowing those trackers to track your uh, experience data, et cetera. Uh, so consumer trust is very, very important. Uh, and the, the shift we're seeing towards Web3 and blockchain actually addresses that uh, deficit of trust, et cetera. Um, I hope I haven't digressed from your question too much and actually answered that. Chris Young, right? Actually, I'm curious to run a quick poll. Raise your hand, anyone in the room who refuses to share their data 99% of the time. Is there anyone here who is one person? Okay, no, what? Oh, people are getting braver when they hear. Okay, can we ask one, uh, the lady here, if you don't mind commenting, explaining why you refuse systematically? Can, uh, wait, one second, can you just tell me? So sometimes, Sometimes it's more about what they're tracking. Sometimes a lot of applications choose to track your location for particularly no reason. So that is one place I mostly refuse to share my data in that sense. Thank you. Uh, I think in most, sorry, and Okay, so I think in most cases in the UAE, most websites don't give you that option. You have to click OK and share your data to get anything, which is not ideal. Uh, but in general, when I have the choice, I opt for no only because I know I'm going to get spammy advertising from those brands and I'm visiting a website because I want to see something once as opposed to see it in retargeting everywhere I go on the internet for the upcoming two, three weeks. Sorry, sorry, just one last point. I think if I know how my data is used and how it can benefit me, I'd be much more than happy to share it. So just, just on that point on location data that you made, there's a real clear example of the second point you made about why would you give consent for location data and who would you give it to? For example, if you're using Uber or Kareem and if you stood outside a restaurant at late at night looking uh, to get your ride home, you will gladly give Kareem access to your location because it serves a purpose. But you may not give your location access to a publisher who just wants to know, you know where you're based, in which neighborhood, et cetera, without giving you a reason or a benefit for why you should share that data. So that's a great example of why consumers are willing, but they need to have a real sense of utility around why they're sharing that piece of data. Well, actually, this weekend I was shopping with my daughter. Every single store asked for me to share my phone number. No explanation, no justification. Why would you need my phone number? And for me, it's because I'm going to start receiving texts spamming my, my phone. So is it fair to say that there's still a lack of one side, education of companies in the region, and second, of actually products that are going to reach out to consumers in the right way, in the way that informs them well enough to accept, to share. Um, Melhem and then maybe Ziad. Uh, just to answer, gentlemen, uh, I understand you don't want to give consent simply because you're still not a client for this specific brand. But once you're a client, you know the benefit, that's when probably you will accept to get the benefit uh, in return. That's exactly what I was talking about before audiences. Because again, segmentation, you talk about segmentation, they will retarget you, et cetera, I understand. But once I become a client to a specific brand, then obviously I will have a bigger intention to share my data. Uh, to answer you, sorry, can you say again what was the question? So the maturity of the market. Yes. Products and education. Yeah, so when it comes to Products and education, I'll, I'll give you from our end, because we've been hearing for the past 15 years, everyone is moving to, we want to become client-centric. In order to become client-centric, many people are trying to 
fix the process of their communication, but then you see an issue with the product. Others will have a personalized product driven by AI, but you don't have the right process to manage it. From our end, I'll tell you, at a global level, we are moving towards becoming uh, a client-centric uh, organization, and we changed the whole organization from process, product, and the whole value chain. From product as an example, when you used to buy any product, that you'd never got any data coming from a product that you're using when it comes to automotive. Now the way we're moving, the product itself will be able to adapt to how much you're giving consent to. So I want you to look at four years from now, when most, let's say, let's assume, people will no longer be buying a car, but will be sharing a car. So I will go in a shared mobility, and if I have enough data stored with this OEM, the whole experience will be a change for me as well. If I want autonomous driving, if I want my specific movie that I used to watch, if I want to use it only for a conference call. So product is changing, definitely. Process as well. So from marketing, how are we going to make sure that any communication will deliver to you for that product? How are we going to make sure that the whole value chain will change completely for you to have a full end-to-end, -end, let's say, AI-driven experience? But are you developing these technologies yourself? Yes, or? yes. And why do you feel that you need to develop them uh, on their products out there that are supposed to facilitate it? Why, why going through the steps of having to go into yeah. becoming a tech company at the end of it? Yes, so in a simple way, when you move from a regular, let's say, we're a 100 plus auto client and we're becoming a data-driven company. In this process that will take three years, obviously we're teaming up with the likes of Google and many other AI platform. But we know for a fact, while their AI is talking about audiences, different AI are helping us with the supply chain. We are forming our own AI for the car itself. And obviously, one AI, which we're calling Stella Brain, connecting the audience, supply chain, what type of AI data we're getting from the likes of Google, and the product itself. Obviously, we have to own it, so. Asad, do you do the same at King Beaver? Do you develop your own product to, to manage your own, your own chains of development for different kinds of... Uh, Look, it depends on the use case. We're primarily, we rely on the existing solutions like, you know, for our CDMPs and as DMPs, we work with likes of Adobe. Uh, we use the Azure Cloud. We, you know, when, whenever there's a need for a certain tweak or a certain development in delivering an experience, for example, we do that. Uh, but for majority of the infrastructure needs, we work with the existing partners that already exist. There's no point, at, we feel, because you know we do it for 120 markets, we do it for um, uh, 400 brands that we work with. Uh, if we start to build solutions for all of them, for all of those markets, I think it becomes a little bit more complicated uh, than it becomes for some, some, certain other organizations. So we rely on our partners like Adobe, we rely on Kigia technologies like Google Cloud, for example, uh, the Google marketing platform to develop uh, those solutions and use cases. Uh, okay. So I can ask you just to go on. No, sure. No, I wanted to ask you, what does that mean for, for a company like Google when you have companies that have nothing to do with tech starting to go into, into this? And uh, Google in particular has been driving a lot in terms of data and data privacy. Uh, how is it changing your relationship with your stakeholders? Again, the, the two key words, in, I think, are data and privacy. Okay, so uh, today it's, as, as I mentioned before, first it's a journey and we're learning as we go. With always setting super high privacy standards, whether the sandbox moving more to a cookie-less world, uh, we wouldn't have the conversation of location after, if, if, we, if we didn't have the iOS 14 update in the last few uh, few months. So a lot, a lot is changing on the, on the privacy side. And everyone in the industry, whether it's the tech companies or the advertisers or brands, etc., are working together to try to develop products to move 
to this cookie world, let's say, while respecting and definitely setting privacy as a top priority for, uh, for themselves. Um, going back to data again, we see five maybe enablers uh, where we work with our partners to unlock uh, better personalization or better experience or better return. One is, again, going back to first party data, how can you leverage all this data, giving again another example, in the last two years, 90% of the data of total human humanity has been created. So how can we really analyze this data, get insights from this data, that's step number one. Step number two, how can we measure it? Step number three, how can we learn and say, okay, we failed here, we will test again. Step number four, now that we measured, how can we hire and create new roles and new capabilities and new uh, people who can come and work on those new areas that are measuring? And the most important one, which is step five, or maybe they're in parallel, is how can we get C-level, C-suite buy-in and sponsorship for all this experience? So those are, I would say, the five areas where Google works with Unilever, with, with all other partners in terms of developing a roadmap for creating a better personalization, a better return, going back to Assad again, getting the attention of the customer, of the user, which is super hard to get at this, at this point in time, and potentially convert or get a return on the investment. Okay, so if you look at it that way, what, what's the stage of maturity of the different stakeholders? Because, for example, consumers, if you look at our audience, or simple research that shows that people are willing to give their data, again, in a this experiment was made, people were okay signing up their data against pizza. Uh, so in the region, people don't, are not specifically concerned about data privacy. What about... The they are, they are actually, by the way. It was, okay. it was surprising. The, again, uh, the percentage of opt-in for the iOS 14 was much, much, much lower than what what everyone forecasted in the in the in the market in terms of uh, allowing apps to track, etc. So, I, I think private. We we tend to say privacy is top priority in Europe, but also in the Middle East. The more we talk to consumer, the more we talk to brands, the more we talk to tech players, they all have privacy and was one of the top priorities for 2022 onward. So. Well, uh, to be honest, we have a global KPI for consent, and we've seen the more we're actually, obviously, we're pushing communication, obviously it's drawing down. But surprisingly, if you look at the consent for different type of audiences, you directly link it to the NPS, Net Promoter Score. So the higher the NPS, you can reach the consent up to 90, 95%. Because people are happy from the experience, with the, whether it's new purchase or after sale, they will be sharing more data, and consent is 90-95%. The good, of course, and the good news for us, and the bad news for what I'm saying for the agencies, for their future business model, when you have such a high consent level, and clients are happy, and you have this direct communication, I'm assuming, because I know for a fact what we're doing, most global brands will be moving from mass communication to one-to-one -to -one communication, especially now with the cookless world, etc. And if currently, historically, let's say you were spending 80% on media, 20% on your infrastructure, this will flip in the coming five years, where we will only be using agencies, third-party data, third-party tech companies to get this incremental audiences that we don't currently have. Add a layer to it to, for example, the chip shortage that we had. We don't have enough products. We know how many clients we have in our database. They're happy. Why would we go and search for new customer, just like the gentleman, ask for a consent, etc., etc.? You start from your own audiences. So the aim, obviously, is to make 95%, 100%, okay? Minimize mass marketing and make sure it's 100% efficient. So I thought if we're looking at the future, uh, as we're talking about these new technologies, increasingly you, you're talking about how to get increasingly people to share this information so that you can create this one-on-one -on -one conversation with them and eventually capture their attention. 
what what would be your uh, your your advice? The do's and don'ts that you think uh, everyone looking at the next stage of technology, and I'm thinking Web3 as well. What are the things that you would? What are the tips that you would share? Look, I think providing trust to the consumers is going to be absolutely important. So, in the manner that you seek consent is very important on all the KPIs that you highlighted as well. Uh, I'll give you an example. If we seek, uh, if you put the consent banner that GDPR requires us to put on our mobile websites, it covers half the page or three quarters of the mobile screen. Roughly 90% of the audiences drop out in certain markets. In UAE and GCC, we see a slightly different uh, behavior, but in markets like Turkey, 90% of those consumers visiting landing on our landing pages do not convert into a cookie or a first party data or even um, a page view, for example. Now, that's where how you provide that consent, how you give that assurance out to consumers that the data you're collecting is going to be put to a relevant use is going to be very, very important. The ridiculous number of startups in the world who are trying to solve this problem, uh, the people who are putting together, I was talking to Alex Hawaii this morning who told me that there is a particular startup, uh, I think somewhere based in uh, Spain, he's working with where uh, by just giving your data, you can actually track where your data is being used and you're actually rewarded in crypto against the usage of that data. Right, so uh, for years, some of the companies have made money off of your data. Now what consumers want to do is make sure that they have control of that monetization. I, they don't probably want to get rich using that, but they want to become more influenced over how and uh, you know where that get data gets used. So if you're as a brand able to provide that assurance, in my opinion, Trust in data governance is as important as putting a purpose behind a brand these days. So if you're a brand X or a brand Y, you could say, hey, look, I stand for a certain purpose in my life. This is how I make my, you know, myself relevant to the consumers. But providing trust in how you use consumer data is going to be, literally be uh, the starting point for any purpose you build on top of your organization. We have a huge global agenda around responsible data frameworks. Uh, we have not gone out and made it so loud in public uh, as much as we should probably, uh, but we're putting a lot of commitment out there in how we actually commit to using consumer data in a very responsible way in how we not only create communication, how we reach consumers, and how we sell our products. And these are essentially few things that we do on the back of that data at the end of the day. I see, I see Ziad nodding his head in approval every, <laughs> at everything you said. But I can't help but think that this also spells some concern for a company like Google, because at the end of the day, I mean, you've been doing quite a lot of money with data. So what does this mean for you? And again, what, would, what advice would you give for the future, for the near future? I think the simple answer is we will continue to make money out of data. Really? So. <laughs> Uh, but going back to what Asad said is how do you do it responsibly? How do you build the trust with the consumer? How do you give value in return? Uh, I ask myself every day, it's like if I want to go today to this place, I go to Google Maps and I say, okay, I want to go to this meeting, okay? So I'm using this platform, I'm getting something on ret in return. Going back to the example of Uber, going back, going back to all those examples, I just want to be a bit more in control as a user of how this data is being used. And I remember internally there was a debate at some point, even at the CEO level, Sundar, is like, do we move completely to a cookie-less world, or do we actually find a solution in between? Okay, and then he was radically pro-moving completely to a cookie-less world, and I said, this is the top priority. Okay, it's more challenging, it's a higher responsibility, more sandboxes, more challenges on what to do with, with current, with the huge data that we have, but at the same time setting the standard as uh, one of the leaders in the tech industry for, uh, for and showing to, you, to our user that we actually respect their data and we make it accessible for everyone. So that's which is, takes us back to the whole mission of Google initially, is like how can we get this information Make sure that it's accessible for everyone and useful at the same time. Do you think that we're already there, changing people's perception of what, uh, what is being done with data? I think glo globally, a lot of work should be done from both parties, both the, the 
everyone, let's say businesses, in terms of awareness, going back as well to what Asad said, a lot of initiative, a lot of companies are really trying and probably they need to be even louder in, in sharing what are the projects, what are the pilots that they're working on. Uh, on the user side, they should, again, an awareness will continue to increase in terms of how this data is created. The startup ecosystem is trying to actually build this awareness both on the B2C side, but also on the B2B side. So I think the future, the bar will always be higher and will continue to be higher in terms of privacy expectation and data usage. But Definitely, this is a challenge that we live in. We go back to all the examples that Milham mentioned, et cetera, on, on how can we actually create better experience, better personalization using AI to, to, leverage, uh, to leverage all this information that, uh, that we capture. So look, Google uses that data not because you know, they were just monetizing it, but they've also done a lot of things like made the you know, wealth of information that exists around the world completely accessible to consumers. There's a benefit of that data. And also, if you look at the responsibility and the technology infrastructure that goes behind protecting consumer data, if you look at the data centers in the world, you know, it could belong to Google, Facebook. They're some of the most secure places in the world, more secure than some of the most, you know, presidential palaces around the world. You cannot, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine at Microsoft and I, I asked him, uh, you have a data center, I heard you opened a data center in UAE, and he said, yes. I said, where is it? He said, nobody knows. Nobody knows where that data center is. So there will be maybe two or three people who would know where that data center is. So that, why is that data center so secure? Because it holds that data that we're all you know, concerned about, that we're all holding very dear to our hearts and how that data provides value to consumers, that data provides value to brands, that data provides value to businesses. Well, actually, Melham, uh, to wrap this up before we move on to questions, uh, do you secure the data that you are aggregating? Is it secure the same way in a very, very safe place? And what would be your tip to the audience? Uh, just to add a point to link it, I think we have to look at, when you look at evolution of the web audiences, marketing, etc. I think what we're talking about is directly linked to decentralization. So people felt for the past 15 years they're not making money out of the data they're generating. We as a company, we are setting up everything to be monetizing data for everyone throughout the chain. So meaning, I'll give you an example. We already announced we're detaching the software of the car from the car itself. You buy a car now, but the software will be updating for four years till you sell it again. So the value of the car, the more sh data you share, the more you enhance it, it will be more expensive for the uh, resale value in the future. In addition, once you give a consent to share your data, again, we might be selling it to some insurance companies or to autonomous driving. The more you share, the more reward you'll get from our products and services. I guess once you give the control to people, showing them that the exchange of value, you're giving me this much, you're getting that much, I think that's the way forward just like how Web3, what we were discussing earlier, will be working. So, wait, wait, wait. so basically you're saying there's a trend towards rewarding people who agree to share their data, including financially. Okay. Can we expect Google to do that one day? You do that. Okay, no, 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 this is content generation. I'm talking about data sharing. probably two weeks, mm -hmm. on, the, uh, on the economic impact uh, of some solutions, such as uh, Google Maps, etc., uh, on the economy itself. So the hours saved by, uh, per, by, by someone using the app, and how can this translate into monetization? So it's not, if, you, if talking direct financial impact, everything has direct financial impact, uh, whatever metric you, you, you would like to use. But uh, going back to your question on what is the advice for the audience, and Milham, when he mentioned that there's a threat for agencies, uh, <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would love to just comment on this if possible. Agencies today have to move with everyone, as we're saying, to this consulting approach or this approach of data-driven 
uh, agencies. In this case, they won't be actually threatened. They will be driving uh, uh, all this change and connecting the dots and acting as a catalyst between the different stakeholders. So uh, answer number one is yes, we're giving value across all the different products, whether to content creator or to user or to businesses. Answer number two, overall in, in MENA, uh, all stakeholders have to rethink their business model, whether it's the agencies or the publishers or the businesses or the tech companies, uh, and put more effort in terms of building this awareness and setting it as a top priority. Everyone is doing this, probably you have to do it more, more specifically outside the UAE. That would be my, my only comment on, on this. Thank you guys so much for the informative session. Uh, I do believe in the capability of Google's algorithms and the pla social platforms. But my question is, do you think that maybe the challenge that could hold back the personalization process is the uninteresting uh, user experience or the, what, what the users go through when the brands reach them. So it's not the Google or the platform's fault, but the brands, when they are reaching their customers, are not doing a good job in terms of the user experience on the website or the creatives and messaging they are using on social media. Cut this hold back the personalization value uh, outcome at the end. So can we blame the brand sometimes for not being able to take advantage of the personalization capability nowadays? I can, I can, yes, absolutely, you can blame the brands for all of that. We do a lot of bad work. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, you, you hit the nail on the head. Like, if the, the moment of truth is that interaction. It is the quality of that interaction that determines consumers' trust in data, that the quality of interaction that determines what impact you're having on the consumer in terms of uh, whatever decision you want the consumer to make. It may be signing up for data, it may be buying your product, etc. cetera. Um, and you, know, you look at, um, again, you know, giving extreme examples of something, something like an Apple. Yes, they do brilliant products. Their iOS is fantastic, Android is fantastic. But when you go on to their app store, uh, the, the store, and you want to buy an iPhone, when you're checking out, it asks you, you have this phone already, do you want to exchange it for this phone? So they're doing something interesting with information that they hold about you. The fact that you, they know that you have a previous iPhone, they're asking you whether you want to exchange it for this phone or not. They've made it relevant. And that experience, to me, is just the crux of everything. So the more thought and thinking we put behind that experience. And that's a creative task. And I will slightly disagree with the agencies. Uh, I think, you know, we have some really interesting agencies in the room. It's their, their creative power and their imagination that turns that moment of truth into magic. So you, we can put all the logic behind the data. We can crunch numbers. We can find relevant audiences, you know. But till we deliver that creative magic in that interaction, nothing is going to happen. And that's why we need uh, the creative people and the creators uh, and the whole economy in the room. Who's working in an agency here? <laughs> oh, okay. I, I actually do yeah, myself as well. Not creative. <laughs> okay. Okay. Clarification. Media agency. Who's working for a media agency here? So how do you feel about what was being said? Anyone? Hi. Um, no, I think uh, very valid points in the sense agencies definitely have to up their game, uh, change the game rather not up their game and act more as consultants because the advertising world has completely changed and it's not going to stop where we are. Um, it's going to grow exponentially. So definitely on point, uh, definitely on point also with the fact that a lot of brands are not doing a great job with the level of data that they have. Um, I would say banking as a sector uh, has still to kind of go that mile to start using their data and uh, not kind of holding it, 
where they have a lot of personal information. Uh, but yeah, I mean, long way to go for the brands, long way to go for the agency. I just had one question. I mean, we know every topic or every technology has two sides to it, right? One is the great positive growth story, uh, which we are all discussing. And one is not so bright story of it. So how do you guys think that AI and personalization can also backfire 10 years from now, for example? Uh, we know like, for example, Facebook is great, definitely great. But um, the way their personalization works, a lot of people are talking about banning Facebook in countries because of hate speeches and things like that. So how do you guys think as Google and as one of the leading brands um, that this could backfire in the future? <laughs> Google. <laughs> Uh, six percent is the number based on BCG of companies who actually cracked the full user experience. So that's you know, 94 percent didn't. However, uh, on the AI front, uh, at some point we were discussing with Natalie. I don't know if you read Sapiens, uh, and in Sapiens there is an example of okay, if there's a self-driving car and there's a kid crossing. So what should and there's an opportunity the car will do an accident. So in this accident, who do you save? Okay, the, 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 the people who are in this car or the, the little um, man or gentleman or lady who is passing, okay? So this is at some point the limitation of, of, of AI. Of course, uh, we talked a lot about algorithm, we talked about, but this algorithm, this is why I started by defining what is an algorithm. It's well-defined, okay? instructions and the instructions are human made again if we go back today to any ad even to ad linking it back to advertising when we start a campaign first thing you say okay let the algorithm learn okay and then it will start optimize etc so all of this is defined by humans it will continue to be defined by humans it will continue to be measured by humans also setting the standard and responsibility on privacy will help us guide this uh, I don't think we have all the we have the answer today, but as long as we commit to like what the three of us mentioned in terms of having privacy as a top priority, making sure that we gain the trust of consumers, having really qualified people, as I said in, in one of the pillars, uh, to focus on cracking this and supporting the algorithm or the AI, we will be a potentially, hopefully, be able to control all of this. That being said, I honestly don't have the answer. And thank you for the gentleman to asking me to answer this difficult question. The example of Sapien, the aim obviously is not to crash anyone. Sorry, I crashed cars. <laughs> uh, just to add a couple of points. We only automate things through AI once you have enough data and you're 100% sure it's actually working. I'll give you an example, which all OEMs now they're talking about, which is obviously autonomous driving, how difficult it could be when scenarios are non-usual for AI to factor in. 10 years ago, I was part of a panel when they presented a concept of how AI will help you with autonomous driving, but in special cases, the camera of the car will actually be linked to someone in back office to have the conscience to make the decision accordingly. Meaning, if there's a specific situation on Sheikh Zayed Road that AI will never know how to solve it, the camera from the car itself will actually link you to someone. Just to mention that AI will always exist, everything will be automated, but in unique cases, there should always be someone as a human being behind the tech itself for these situations. You have a car, and I'm sure you have the uh, emergency uh, call in it. So, again, if you look at what everyone does in the industry, if you have an accident, God forbid, it will directly be linked to a human being. It can be linked directly to uh, the police, etc., etc. But in these situations, you need consciousness. Currently, how AI is developing, it will take time to do this. So, our role as brands is always to have someone uh, behind it. Final word. 
No, I don't know if I can have the final word, but look, I think responsible AI, again, is, is a very big subject in the world these days. I think we are centuries away from those, um, you know, those ideas of suddenly one machine taking over and taking control of the world. I don't think that's going to happen. AI is very much a utility now. It's still being programmed by human. I mean, AI started writing code, but that logical thinking of humans still rules. Um, as long as humans are responsible, I think AI will be responsible. That's my uh, word. Thank you. Well, it's interesting because I was just out in another session about AI where the professor uh, who is a specialist in AI was explaining that the next step in the coming two years is um, an overarching authority monitoring AI in every single company to use it responsibly. Yeah. So the techno Ministry of Artificial Intelligence in Dubai. Yes, but actually a technology monitoring the technology. So it's a step further. So there's a lot happening. Anything else anyone wants to say? We're good? Well, thank you so much. Uh, enjoy the break and thank you to our speakers. <laughs>